All right, so hey, welcome everybody to the uh, colloquium. It's good to see so many people here. Um, and uh, those of you on Zoom, uh, come join us. Uh, be good to get more people in the room. Then uh, come visit us for a colloquium. To be brief, uh, John came here by way of Caltech, Harvard, Harvard, Chicago, Stanford. Um, okay, a little bit more specific. He was an undergrad at Caltech. He went to Harvard apparently for grad school, but then um, uh, rather than stepping on the Harvard campus, he quickly ran over to MIT to actually do his uh, doctoral work there, working in the group of Vladan Bulatich, doing some really great uh, experiments on uh, probing atomic gases and, and optical cavities. And then uh, from there, he went bona fide to Harvard and about uh, you know what what the real requirements are for uh, a system to act like a material system uh, and some of the things that photons do naturally normal materials do not and that gives us some really unique opportunities okay so before we jump uh, too much into the details here I think it's uh, worth starting with this question of uh, when I say we are making materials out of light what do I even mean by that what does it mean uh, for something to be a material. I realized I didn't start my timer here. Great. Can't see my mouse. There it is. Close that. Great. All right. Um, so, you know, what do we mean when we say we're going to make a material out of light? Um, so, the place where I always like to start is the simplest example of a material light -like system that I can think of. What I have is a bunch of little uh, balls here that attract each other when they're far apart, repel each other when they're close together, and uh, there's a little bit of friction in this world. So when we just let dynamics occur, we kind of get the material automatically. 
We didn't have to tell these things to crystallize. All we had to tell them was what the underlying rules of physics are, and they minimize their own energy under the dynamical laws uh, and give us some material system. And you can see it has kind of phonons, it's shaking, it's got some long range order, so forth. So what did we need to do to, uh, to get this? Well, we needed to make our photons uh, act like, it, or whatever these objects are, they needed to have uh, these particles. So that means they need to respond to forces. Okay, um, and uh, they need to interact with one another. That's two of the requirements. And the third is we need some way to suck entropy out of the system. There we go. Uh, and so that's what we really need uh, to, to make a material here. Now there's another question, which I think is a little bit uh, more technical and less interesting. What makes this system quantum? Well, in some sense, I would say that the entanglement between the particles uh, controls the material properties, okay? And that, that's what I mean when I say a quantum material. Uh, and one way to think about that quantitatively is that the dynamics of the individual particles and their interactions are fast compared to any decoherence, any coupling to the outside universe. So for context, what does that mean? That means that if you have a collection of marbles that are interacting with air or so forth and getting entangled with the outside universe with the air through light, Etc. that's not a quantum material. A single atom, which is made up of a bunch of electrons and protons and neutrons, by my definition, would be a quantum material. Its spectrum is determined by the uh, entanglement and ordering of the electrons. Okay, so what are the challenges to doing this with light? The first challenge is that if I take a, an electron or a ball or what have you, and it's moving to the right and I apply a force to the left, well, it slows down and it turns around. What happens if I have a photon that's moving to the right and I apply a force to the left? Ugh, it changes color. Uh, so, so that's a little bit concerning, right? That's not how materials behave. We would like when our photons have some interaction between them that their trajectories change and that they don't just change color, right? So. How can we understand that this is happening? Well, I think the simplest answer is that if you look at the dispersion relation for a photon, that is the relationship between its energy and its momentum. Well, what a force does is it changes the momentum of the photon, okay? But the problem is that the velocity of the photon is given by the local slope of the line. So as you change the momentum, you're moving it along this line, but the slope doesn't change. Okay, and so what that means is that forces change the momentum of the photons, but they don't change the velocity. Okay, and so the picture you should then have in mind is I need to trap my light in some medium that changes the energy momentum dispersion and thus makes the photons act as though they have a mass and can respond to forces by speeding up and slowing down. Okay, that's challenge number one. We've solved it. We've only got a couple more challenges and then we're done and we can all go get dinner. Um, challenge number two, if I have two electrons and they come towards each other, when they get close, they collide and bounce off. You like that CGI? That was, that's George Lucas, he made that for me. Um, what happens if we have two photons? Well, the basic challenge is this, Maxwell's equations are linear. So if I have a solution for one photon moving to the right, and a solution for another photon moving to the left, well, the sum of those two is also a solution. The photons just go right through each other, okay? This is a problem. Our photons don't collide. Uh, we need some way to solve that. Well, let's take some inspiration from how electrons collide. Electrons collide by exchanging virtual photons. So you might say maybe photons could collide by exchanging virtual electrons. Well, that's uh, disallowed by all of the conservation laws, but, but, you can, uh, but you can draw a higher order Feynman diagram like this where the photons exchange electron positron pairs. And that looks better except that the cross section is extremely small, meaning that this almost never happens for optical photons, but we got the idea right. The idea oops, is that we should use some material system to mediate interactions between our photons. Our two photons interact each with some material. 
the material particles interact with each other and back act on the photon. Okay, and so in some sense, it is sort of turning the way that electrons interact with each other on its head. Great. So what's the third challenge? The third challenge, if you want to make a quantum material, is that we didn't want interactions with our environment, right? Because we said we would like the particles to become entangled with one another and being connected to your environment sort of traces out your entanglement. You're becoming entangled with the environment and so you can't see the entanglement between the particles. So what happens to this model of a crystal if I just let this system evolve without the friction? It looks like grad students at the cookie hour before the, uh, I don't know, when is your cookie hour? Do you have a cookie hour? Before or after? You didn't take me to the, to the cookie? There are virtual cookies? My favorite thing to do in graduate school, incidentally, at Harvard, um, was uh, go to the cookie hour. So they had great cookies. I would have three or four of these big cookies and a nice big glass of tea. And then I would have a nice nap during the colloquium. Um, so and so I'm, I'm trying to give a talk that facilitates that for any of you who are uh, um, looking to sleep. So, so anyway, the question is, how do we maintain the ability of the system to become entangled, even in the presence of something that allows us to cool towards the many body ground state? So there are a number of answers here. One solution is sort of particle by particle assembly to the lowest energy states. Um, uh, another, which sort of looks a little bit like a quantum computer, you're pi pulsing particles in in the low energy states of the system. Another possibility is local cooling. Um, so, okay, this is a broad introduction to making uh, materials in general, what's required, how we'll do it a little bit with light. I'm sure most of you haven't thought very much about making materials out of light. So let's just step back broadly and think about how these things that we want to have come to be in other platforms. I would say if you're working with electrons, the Coulomb interaction is the interaction between the particles. And indeed, even though the electrons inter, uh, have mass in free space, when you put them in a solid, the ionic lattice produces a band structure that sort of renormalizes that mass. It changes the uh, momentum energy dispersion of the electrons, okay? An, an extremely lively uh, field right now is cold atoms and optical lattices to explore material science. And there the interacting particles are atoms that interact through some van der Waals interaction. Um, and their dispersion is controlled by a lattice made by interfering laser beams. So our story today then is going to be uh, interacting photons with some medium mediating interactions between them and either optical cavities or microwave cavities sort of controlling the dispersion uh, of the photons. Um, so I wanna tell you about two platforms. Most of this talk is gonna be about lattice gases of microwave photons, okay? Uh, where the interactions between the photons are mediated by Josephson junction. Um, and the dispersion just comes from the way that both the, the cavities are coupled to each other. And the, uh, and the, the second uh, piece of the talk, time permitting, will be about making materials out of optical photons in optical resonators, where the geometry of the resonator controls the dynamics of the photons. And they're made to interact by uh, having them collide and be absorbed by atoms that go up to the woodwork. Okay, um, so uh, things to think about as we go through this story. Uh, I think it's quite neat to think broadly about what kind of tools one has uh, for engineering the, uh, the behaviors of the particles, um, both in terms of uh, their dispersion and in terms of how we make them collide with one another and the sort of different techniques that are available for photons for uh, inducing them to, 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 uh, to uh, order. Um, and if you do uh, fall asleep in the first half, there will be sort of a clear intermission uh, for you to uh, wake up and, uh, and maybe hear the second half. And the other way around too, if you get tired during the first half, the second half is a great time to nap. 
Okay. Um, I have a chat request here. Someone assign me as the host. Okay. So um, I think that's a sort of a the end of the zeroth story. So if there are questions, I can take them at this point, or we can just uh, dive right in. Yes, we're zero indexing. That's right. This is Python, not mathematics. Are you taking pictures of the powder puff girl or Emmy the cat? Oh, the whole slide. Okay. Um, so um, onwards. So the first story I'm going to tell you is about making fluids and solids uh, out of microwave photons and lattices. Okay. So let's take again a step back and talk about what is sort of a, a paradigmatic model of, uh, uh, of, a, of a material. Uh, and what we can say is that this model, you have electrons that hop around in some ionic lattice and collide with each other when they get close together. Okay. And so the picture is this first term allows your particles to hop between adjacent sites. And the second term says, what is a collision? Well, if two particles are on the same site, I pay some interaction energy U. Okay. And it turns out that that's enough to get a lot of the uh, properties of materials that, uh, that are worth exploring. What one could even say is this is enough to build up massive entanglement between your particles. And so the question is, how do we engineer these ingredients for uh, microwave photons? Well, there were a lot of proposals for how one might do that. Um, and there were lots of beautiful different pictures of what it might look like. Um, ours looks actually the most like this proposal from Andrew Houck's group. Uh, and yes, uh, Dave Schuster and I are using the Simon & Schuster Publishing House logo. Um, what, what I like to say is that we hope to someday be famous enough that they sue us to get us to stop using that logo. But, uh, but it seems unlikely uh, at this stage. Um, so um, the question is, you know, what constitutes a lattice site that can hold photons? Uh, the simplest thing that you can think of that can hold photons is an LC circuit. What is the frequency of the photons that it can hold? One over two pi root LC, right? So this is our lattice site, if you will. And then if we look at the energy level of this system, energy levels, the lowest energy state is zero photons. So this is just kind of quantizing an LC circuit, okay? The first excited state has one photon and it has, you know, one over two pi root LC times H bar, more energy. And then the next excited state has two photons and so on and so forth. The problem is, remember we said a key part of this story is that we want the photons to interact with each other. And what we said is that interaction means that putting two photons on one lattice site costs a different amount of energy than having them on separate lattice sites. Right, so this isn't going to cut it. We need to change that second number there. Okay, and and the basic problem is that this LC circuit is linear. Okay, which is to say the inductance is constant, the capacitance is constant, independent of how many photons there are in the system. So how do we get around this? Well, uh, one thing that uh, who's ever built an LC circuit? Okay, a couple of you. Have you ever tried to uh, drive it really hard with your function generator? And did you see the resonance move? Well, yes, that happens too. Depending on how hard you drive it and what frequency it's at, you can hear it oscillating, right? Some sort of, uh, you know, uh, Lenz's law of mechanical forces on the inductor. You can also see the inductor heat up, right? Either of those things changes the resonance frequency, right? So that's great. The only problem is to get it to either be mechanically deformed or to heat up requires like 10 to the 10 photons or something. Okay. So uh, we wanted it to move with one photon, but we need 10 to the 10. And that's not great if you want to study quantum science. Why? Because if you lose one of those 10 to the 10 photons, that collapses the quantum state of your system. Okay. So we can't have that. Uh, we want to do this with one photon. So the obvious thing you say is, well, it'll uh, 
the resonant frequency will change at lower photon numbers if I make this inductor smaller, right? Like physically smaller. And it turns out the extreme limit of that is replacing the Josephson, or replacing the inductor with a Josephson dunk. Okay. And so we don't need to talk too much about exactly how this works microscopically. There's some tumbling of Cooper pairs on. It's a fun story. And mostly I'm an atomic physicist, so I probably couldn't do it justice if you called me on it. But you can call me on it at the end if you'd like. Um, but the, the moral of the story is this gives us an inductance which depends upon the current. OK? And so what that means is that if this first photon has 4.5 gigahertz of energy, the second one that you put in will have, say, 4.2 gigahertz times function. This is a giant difference. And so we can say that this is an attractive interaction between the photons with an energy of Planck's constant times about 300 mega. Okay? And this object is up to some technical uh, details, what uh, people like IBM and Google and Amazon call a transmon qubit. Okay? So if you take nothing else away from this story, this is a nice thing to take away. But then you're like, but John, you see, I see three levels here. In what sense is this a qubit, right? Should have two states. Well, the point is because it's anharmonic, because this second, this 4.2 gigahertz is different from the 4.5 gigahertz. If I excite it from the ground state to the first excited state, that will not resonantly take me from the first excited state to the second excited state. So it creates an effective two-level system that I can use as a quantum computer. Okay. So what's the next piece here? Suppose I would like to have tunneling between these two lattice sites. What do I do? I connect them together with a capacitor. Okay. And the value of that capacitor determines uh, how much tunneling I have. And the wonderful thing about this approach is that you can uh, nanofabricate it and get essentially whatever parameters you want. And, uh, and, and it's especially wonderful for me because this is a close collaboration with Dave Schuster's group. So I don't even have to deal with the fabrication. Uh, so it, it's no effort for me to fabricate. You should find yourself a collaboration like that. That's really, uh, that's really the, the best of all possible worlds. But the basic point is, in some sense, what we've done is take tools that were originally developed by Dave and Rob Shokoff for quantum computing and applied them in this new fun way to, uh, to make materials out of microwave. Okay. So what do the numbers look like here? Well, the interaction energy is about 300 megahertz. The tunneling rate is about 10 megahertz. The photons live for like 40 microseconds, depending on the particular device, which means they can collide about 12,000 times. That's the product of these two numbers, or tunnel about 300, 400 sites. That's the product of those two numbers with, within their lifetime. And so that's enough time to build up some entanglement before they decay. Okay, so that gets us well into this regime where we can study uh, uh, quantum science in this platform. And I would point out that, point out that these numbers are actually quite comparable to what one can achieve with cold atoms and optical lattices. The systems are, however, quite different. Uh, one big disadvantage to working with these microwave photons is that every transmon is unique and special, um, which is to say it'll have a different resonance frequency. You have to tune it up, it's sensitive to magnetic fields in, in a way that all atoms are identical, right, up to their spin. Okay, whatever, right? But uh, there are technical challenges associated with the photons, and there are also advantages to it. So you, you, you'll hear this story, but this is not to say that this is in any sense a replacement for what one can do with cold data. It's, uh, it's quite a different problem. So you can play games where you can spectroscopically resolve these different excitation states from zero to one photon, or the, sorry, zero to one or one to two photons. Uh, in a single lattice site, you can couple two lattice sites together and watch the particles tunnel back and forth very nicely. This is actually single photon tunneling works really nice. 
actually. And uh, we can even couple even more sites together and watch the quantum random walk of these photons. Okay. So then the question is, uh, what if we want to stable? Uh, actually, I think I didn't include uh, that slide. Yeah. Let's put that slide there. Yeah. Um, this isn't even the slide I want. Okay, whatever. Um, so the question is, how do we then prepare some ground state in this kind of a model, right? I told you how to make the photons hop around from one lattice site to another. I told you how to make them collide with each other. But remember, if you just throw particles into your system, they're going to run around like angry grad students at a, at, a, at a coffee hour. You need some way to help them calm down. And I'll give you a hint, it's not coffee. Um, so one thing you can do is uh, you know, connect them to some thermal reservoir that takes out the excess energy. That's the colloquium, take all the energy out of the student. Um, Another thing you can do is adiabatically change your Hamiltonian. Okay, start in some ground state that you can easily prepare, say in a weakly interacting regime, and then adiabatically either reduce the kinetic energy term or turn on interactions and have your particles order. Uh, and a last thing that you can do is potentially, you know, measure the full spectrum of the system and show that it's um, um, see that you know the system has all of these single particle eigenstates. We find the lowest energy one that puts one particle in, and then we can look at the two particle eigenstates. We can find the lowest energy two particle state and build up some state in that. So what I would say is, in the cold atom community, this approach has been very well explored. Okay, and the story there is basically that it's I, I, I'm going to say it's very easy to make a Bose-Einstein condensate. Right, very easy. Uh, if we have any AMO grad students in here, they're uh, burning up on the inside right now. But, but what I would say is, it's not that it's very easy, but you can very reproducibly and controllably make this many body quantum ground state of very weakly interacting atoms. And then you turn on interactions, turn on a lattice to cause them to become entangled in order. Okay, what I'd like to show you first is that there are ways to take photons and pool them directly into ordered states. Okay, so what does that look like uh, experimentally? Well, we're going to take this lattice and we're going to couple it to this weird looking reservoir that repeatedly, whenever it's empty, refills itself with exactly one photon, which is resonant to hop into the lattice. So what happens if I do that? That photon can hop into the lattice and then this thing refills itself. But remember now this, pho this photon can no longer hop into the lattice, can it? Because there's some interaction energy cost to put a second photon onto that lattice site that you can't pay. But eventually this first photon will randomly walk a little more into the lattice and then the can hop in and so on and so forth. So it turns out that this kind of an approach um, what I would call dissipative stabilization, irreversibly injecting particles into the lattice, uh, will work for any incompressible phase of matter. Okay. Before we push ahead here, though, let me point out the naive thing that you might have thought to yourself is why not just drive this lattice site with a coherent tone that puts photons in? Why not do that? Well, the problem is that coherent tone can also take photons out. Okay. And so what that's saying is you will never prepare the many body ground state of this system through that kind of a unitary process. It can put it in, it can also take it out. So you can't suck entropy out of the system with that. By contrast, this object can irreversibly put particles into your system, right? And so it can suck entropy out. Mike. Those terms, if you drive hard, matter a lot. Um, what I would, so he's asking about the A dagger, A dagger plus AA term, right? Those, what I would say is we're not driving any of these sites. So these are like counter rotating terms in the Hamiltonian. They will matter in how we make this object, 
right? Uh, but for example, for tunneling processes, the terms would look like A dagger, B dagger, create a particle on both of these lattice sites. And here we've made the tunneling energy like 10 megahertz compared to the bare photon energy of like five gigahertz. So we've very intentionally turned off those terms. Now, there are certainly regimes where they're interesting if you want to study like Diffie models. But uh, uh, we've, we've sort of tried to create hierarchies of energy scales so that some of the craziness of circuit QED goes away. Okay. So, so then the question is, how do we realize these ingredients? Well, this is what this whole circuit looks like in practice. This is a micrograph of the object that I've color coded for you. Each one of these lattice sites is one of those little crosses, okay? It's, um, and then they're coupled together through the capacitance just set by the spacing between. Them. And then we have little cavities up here that we use to read out the occupation of the individual lattice sites. So you should really think about this if you come from the atomic physics community as a kind of quantum gas microscope for microwave photons. In, in a sort of eight site lattice kind of way. Mike. Um, well, all I had to do was move that line up. <laughs> so, so the answer is we didn't. I've drawn it in this way to make it not confusing to AMO people, but it turns out that it actually doesn't matter whether you have an attractive or repulsive nonlinearity for this kind of a dissipative stabilization scheme, okay? The only situation in which one might imagine it mat would matter is if the, their um, view were on the order of the uh, photon energy, and it's not. So let me, maybe I can explain that question to people. I've drawn it as though the photons repel each other, but in fact, U is negative, which means that it costs less energy to have two photons on the same site than on adjacent sites. Now, you might say that means the photons are attracted to each other, but remember, an attractive interaction, for them to be attracted, there has to be some gradient in the interaction over lattice sites, right? If it's just that they can't be on the same site without paying or gaining an energy, that doesn't actually attract them to each other or repel them from each other, unless you have dissipation in the system to take out that extra energy. Right, but because this system has no internal dissipation, as long as it's putting two on the same site is different from having them on adjacent sites, they won't hop on top of each other. Yes. And in fact, more than that, it would make the ground state a state where all of the particles live on the same site. Right. What I would say is, in some sense, what we're going to find through all of this is that. This thing stabilizes a family of incompressible states, okay? But it doesn't stay, it, the ground state is sort of a weird term in this kind of a system in general. What's the ground state of this lattice? The ground state is no photons in there at all, right? So in, in some sense, we're not really stabilizing ground state or excited state. What, what we're learning here in, in some sense about these kind of quantum systems is the more natural thing is you pick some kind of a target state to stabilize and you stabilize that, right? But whether it's a ground state or excited state is sort of more confusing. But yeah, in some sense, we're stabilizing the highest excited state, okay? And if that's making you uncomfortable, that's sort of the point of the talk, so good on you. Um, okay, so we know how to make the lattice sites. We know how to tunnel couple them together. We've got these uh, cavities to read out their occupations if people are interested in how that works. I can tell you more later. The one thing we don't know how to do is make this object that makes the magic happen, that breaks reversibility. So what does that look like uh, in practice? Let's uh, take a look. We would like a lattice site that if it's ever empty, fills itself up, right? So again, you might say, let's just drive that with a coherent tone at the energy difference between zero photon and one photon. What's the problem with that? Well, it's the same thing. If that tone puts a photon in, 
it will also take a photon out, fully, right? So we can't drive that transition. So here's a question, who has ever made a laser? Did you think carefully about how you generated the inversion in that laser? Who's ever made a non-diode laser? Okay, we've got one. Um, so when you make a non-diode, I've never made a non-diode laser. Um, when, when, when you make a non-diode laser, what usually happens is you pump it with another laser at a shorter wavelength, and then it lasers at a longer wavelength, okay? So what's going on there is you need to generate an inversion in the gain medium. You need to prepare a bunch of atoms in some excited state inside of your laser cavity that can be stimulated to emit, right? But if you just shined light on them on that transition, you'd never get more than half of them in the excited state, okay? You're all learning about how to make lasers. This is gonna be great. You can go work with dye lasers with Dan. I, I learned today that in their titanium experiment, they may need some dye lasers. And so that's, that's what this whole pitch is about. Anyone? No. Um, I'm just kidding. No, but they do, they are going to do dye lasers. Um, so what we need to do is use some laser that can excite the atom up to two, this doubly excited state, and then induce it to decay really fast down to the singly excited state, right? And then it'll live in this singly excited state for a long time. But, so what we need to do is have some way to drive it up to this two photon state, which we can do just by sending in two photons at half of that energy but we need it to decay from two to one really fast. Otherwise we're gonna get Rabi oscillations between two and zero. We don't want that, okay? So how do we make it decay really fast? Well, that's really easy. We connect it up to a resonant circuit, which is resonant for the two to one transition, but that has a lot of damping, okay? And because the two to one transition is at a different energy from the one to zero transition, this thing very rapidly decays from two to one, but this circuit doesn't very much affect the one to zero transition. Isn't that cool? He likes it, right? And this is sort of, I would call this in some sense reservoir engineering. The point is when people talk about reservoir engineering as a concept, they say, we wanna use dissipation to our advantage. And I have to say, when I first heard that, I said, that can't be right, dissipation is always bad, right? But the point here is we don't have Markovian dissipation, right? We have frequency dependent dissipation. This thing just dissipates at the frequency of this two to one transition. And that we can use as a very powerful tool to sort of shape what happens with this, uh, with this transmon qubit. So now we can excite that from zero to two photons. It will decay, oops, it will decay rapidly from two to one, and then live there until the photon leaks out, okay? But that laser that excited it from zero to two, it's actually just an RF source, but we can call it a laser, it's the same thing, uh, won't affect this one excitation state, so we're good to go, okay? But this is literally what people do to make gain media in, uh, in, in laser cavities. The only difference is they don't engineer that this two to one transition is fast. Uh, God engineered that for the spaghetti monster, whoever you believe in, and you just pick an atom or molecule that has the decay rate that, uh, that works well for you. But with the circuits, we can make whatever we want. Okay, so we now know how to make all of the pieces of this object. What happens when we put them together? So what we're gonna do is uh, look at the temporal filling dynamics of this lattice, okay? Um, what I'm showing you is the occupation of each of the lattice sites on the x-axis of which there are going to be seven. And then the refiller, what one might call a chemical potential, um, uh, lives at the right edge of the system and time is gonna be on the vertical axis. So sure enough, the system fills up in some fraction of a microsecond and is stabilized there. Um, you look confused by that. So here's what I would say. When I talk about chemical potential, 
What I mean is, um, you know, if I couple a system to a reservoir, that reservoir has some chemical potential, right? And if it, and it, it fills photons, it puts particles into your system until the cost to put more particles in increases beyond that chemical potential, and then it doesn't put any more particles in, right? So I think there's some question of whether that's the right usage, but at least now we're on the same page about what the usage is. So the picture is the resistor is Markovian, okay? But if you look at how that RLC circuit damps the transmon, it looks like the transmon is coupled to a non-Markovian reservoir. Does that make sense? Yes, it depends, it depends where you think of it as, as, as an environment. But, but I agree completely, when we try to do the full numerical model, the cleanest thing is to provide Markovian damping of that damping circuit. If you try to model the master equation with the non-Markovian damping, you get crazy history dependent red field equations, and it's just much easier to not do that. So you might notice that this is not perfect. Um, we're not getting exactly one everywhere. What's going on? The basic challenge is that the resistor, which is providing the initial Markovian damping, is not at zero temperature. And so what that means is the dilution refrigerator itself is actually sort of thermalizing with the, uh, with the mod insulator, or with, with, this, with, this, with the circuit. Okay. Um, and you can even see this sort of Lee Robinson filling front. Um, so the next thing one might ask is um, what happened, like how does this system refill itself? Okay. Um, so what we do is we let the system fill up and then we take out one particle just with a pi pulse, get rid of one of the photons. And then we ask, how does, how, how does that hole refill over time? Well, if I just watch the dynamics of the system without this refilling object, that hole runs back and forth like a quantum random walk. Now, I have to say, I was initially a little confused that you get such a nice line here, but it turns out that a quantum random walk starting at the edge does produce a fairly nice line, a little surprising. Um, if we turn on the stabilizer, well, then what happens? We get a quantum random walk until it gets the stabilizer and then it's eaten and, uh, and the system is in steady state. Okay, good? Good. Um, so I've told you how to make a sort of crystal of photons with one particle per site. Um, and I told you that this approach works when the system can fill up to some compressibility gap Right, and then no more particles can enter. But you might reasonably want to make a fluid of photons, right? I want to make the ground state of, say, uh, two photons in the lattice. Okay, this is clearly not the ground state. They can delocalize a little bit and become correlated in space. How would I make that object if I can't use this kind of uh, dissipative stabilization to do it? Okay. Um, so what tools do we have at our disposal? We can pi pulse the individual lattice sites uh, and we can tune the energies of the individual lattice sites. Is there some way that we can prepare this superfluid? I'd like to show you what I think is a really cool way to use disorder to address the many body states uh, and then adiabatically prepare the superfluid. So what's the idea? Let's warm up by tuning all of the lattice sites to different energies. Okay, the vertical axis here is the energy of the lattice sites. And then Let's say that I pi pulse one photon into the lowest energy lattice site. So far, so good. What happens as I reduce the disorder of the lattice adiabatically down to zero? Well, what you can see here is that this lowest energy state 
map to the lowest energy state in the ordered lattice, which is some delocalized state, right? By this adiabatic theorem. So if I tune this disorder slowly enough, I can prepare the lowest energy state. If I put one photon into the second state here and I tune the disorder to zero, I can prepare this uh, first excited state and so forth. Um, and so the picture you should have in mind is that as I vary the disorder, right, like the, the state of the, the particles start to tunnel between the lattice sites and, uh, uh, and delocalizes over the whole lattice. And so indeed we can do this experimentally. Uh, and so this is showing if we start the photon off in the lowest energy state, and then we let it delocalize as we adiabatically turn down the disorder, we prepare the lowest energy state. First excited, second excited, third excited, Mike. What do we tune? We tune the, there's, there's a second, there's a squid loop associated with each transmon. And we tune the flux through that squid loop, which effectively tunes the lattice site frequency. I assume that's what you're asking, right? Well, we can tune that. We can't actually tune the tunneling energy. Okay? So we can make the single particle states very easily. Um, and the interesting thing is that uh, you have to be very careful about how fast you perform this sweep to see if you're make, uh, actually making the, uh, the many body ground state. So in this case, we could just see that when we went slowly enough, we got the states that we knew were the ground states. But the question is, imagine that you didn't know what the ground state was. How could you tell if you made it? Well, we came up with what I think is kind of a cool protocol. You adiabatically turn your disorder down, and then you adiabatically turn your disorder back up, okay? And see if your particle goes back to the same lattice site that it started in, okay? If you do this very, very fast, the particle doesn't have time to tunnel at all, doesn't delocalize, and you go back to the same state you started in. As you start to do it slower and slower, the particle's probability of going back to the same site goes down to zero or goes down to something very small because you're not adiabatic. The particle has time to tunnel and it kind of delocalizes and ends up all over the lattice. Okay. If you then go even slower, you adiabatically delocalize the particle and then adiabatically relocalize the particle. And this tells you that you're doing everything slowly enough without knowing what the state was that you, that you made, okay? So this is important because uh, this is what the, the three particle manifold looks like. It looks like a nightmare, right? But the cool thing is when we have all of our disorder turned on, we know what the ground state is, don't we? The ground state is one particle on each of those three lowest energy lattice sites. Yeah, right? That minimizes their energy and it minimizes this interaction energy. And so what we can then do is use that reversibility protocol to make sure that the state we made is the ground state um, and then see what the ground state is. Yes, Dan. Yeah, is it exactly the same? It's this, it's, sorry, we should be careful. I called it disorder because this is not ordered, but it is not statistically random disorder. It's the same pattern on every shot, right? And we control, we control it to go to be the same. Yeah. Does that answer your question more or less? Uh, if you really use disorder, then occasionally you would get two that were near each other and that wouldn't be great. Okay. Um, so indeed, we can do this. And at the end, we prepare three particles delocalized and sort of correlated over seven lattice sites. Uh, the data is this red, the theory that comes from exact diagonalization is the gray, works very nicely. Um, and again, you can look at this kind of reversibility in terms of the uh, occupation of each of the three lattice sites that we initially prepared. This is, I, I think this is actually pretty wild data. This is the ramp speed varying over four decades. 
um, you do see that at the slow at the slowest ramp speed things go back down. Does anyone have guesses as to why? Yeah, but that at these very long times the particles are just lost due to the fact that there's damping in the resonator. Okay, um, so great, but then you ask, well, how do we tell if the photons are really in some kind of an ordered state? And you can look at their correlations in space. Uh, the more particles you have in the system, this is two particles in seven sites. They, uh, they avoid each other over like two or three lattice sites. If you have three particles, they only avoid each other over one or two lattice sites. So this seems to be working. You can also ask whether uh, the particles are, are actually delocalized. Um, and the way we do that is by measuring like single lattice site uh, uh, entropy, which is to say we do tomography of a single lattice site and we see whether it's in a pure state by, oh, that's how you feel about single site tomography? Now, I have to say that's how I felt about it initially, but I do think it's kind of cool. And the basic point is if, if a given lattice site is not entangled with the other lattice sites, and it's occupied 50% of the time, then there should be some phase of pi over two pulse that you can apply to that lattice site to bring it always to the excited state or always to the ground state. And so what you can do is kind of look at averaging over all phases, if there's any phase that can do that, and that tells you whether you're entangled with the environment or with another lattice site, or if that site is in a pure state. And what we find is that when the detunings uh, get small, uh, the sites are very strongly entangled with, their, with, with something. But because it's reversible, it must not be the environment. It must be the other lot of sites. Um, so I think just as a teaser, we've started to make these bosonic Joseph conjunctions, three sites and then a tunnel barrier and then another three sites. And we can actually see Josephson oscillations but those also couple to the phonons in each of the two wells. It's, uh, it's, it's a pretty fun uh, new thing to play with. What we would like to eventually do is combine this with some of our topological lattices to make uh, fractional quantum Hall states of, uh, of microwave photons. Um, so I, I get two hours, right? Then. Yeah, <laughs> that, you mean the drive down to change? That, see, there was going to be a dinner, but I think that's Dan's way of saying if there's a second hour, we don't, I don't get to have dinner with him either. Um, so uh, let me just conclude by saying that there's a whole other story that uh, I probably won't tell you today. Uh, well, maybe I'll stick around. We can do dinner in two hours. Um, uh, about trapping optical photons in multimode optical resonators and how the different modes of, that res of those resonators correspond to the eigenstates of a quantum harmonic oscillator, and how if you make that resonator a four mirror resonator instead of a two mirror resonator, you can generate effective magnetic fields for light, and then how to make those photons interact with each other through Rydberg atoms uh, and, and, and start to build topological phases of optical photons. But in some sense, I think this gives you uh, an idea of the kind of story that that's going to be. We figure out what the physical ingredients are that we want, and then we map stories about ray tracing and about ABCD matrices and modes of cavities onto physical models of particles moving around in space. Okay, so uh, the only other thing that I need to do is, uh, well, I guess two things. One is plug uh, a new experiment that just started working where we've uh, actually succeeded in uh, interconverting optical and millimeter wave photons using uh, uh, a cryogenic cold atom experiment where the uh, Rydberg atoms are trapped, co-trapped inside of optical and millimeter wave resonators. Uh, so this is a, a super fun uh, experiment. If any of you are looking for a graduate project or a doctoral project, a fun one. The other ones are fun too. Um, and the most important slide, of course, uh, these are the folks who did uh, all of the work while I sat in my office uh, and drank martinis. That's, uh, I think that's what the faculty here do, right? <laughs> <laughs>
or bourbon or something. So anyway, thank you to all of them and thank you to you guys for your time. So that's a very good question. Um, the deal is there are manifolds that you, the on-site interaction energy is very large compared to that whole spectrum that I showed you. There is a whole other manifold at stakes when two particles are on top of each other and a whole nother manifold when all three particles are on top of each other. So the point is, whether those other manifolds are above or below, we want to be in a manifold where the particles aren't on top of each other. So we just prepare the lowest energy eigenstate where they're not on top of each other. You could imagine, so how, how does J, the tunneling energy or the disorder compare to you? Let's say you was five times the uh, tunneling energy, okay? Then you could imagine that if you just add a little bit of disorder with three particles, there might be an avoided crossing between one state in the manifold where two particles live on top of each other and some state in the manifold where they don't. And then things would be extremely complicated, right? Because you could have avoided crossings between the manifolds and have them hop onto each other. But we were very careful to work in the limit where our J is like 10 megahertz and our U is 250 megahertz, right? So what that means is you should really think of us as living within manifolds of fixed numbers of particles on top of each other. Like it's really a hardcore kind of a limit. Does that sort of answer your question? Uh, the, I mean, we go up to like probably 40 megahertz or something. So there are 50, there's still a lot of space. But that's a great question. Yes, if you made your disorder 100, 150 megahertz, you could again run into it. And if you notice, we also were very careful to have them staggered up and down uh, so that if there are off, uh, you know, for, for sites, they, they can't really hybridize with their neighbors either. That means you don't need as much, much spectral range because you'd have to virtually go to another site. Very good question. Much better than any of Dan's. Uh -huh. um, they're like regular Joseph's injunctions, but they're made with bosons. Yes, I know that's a uh, that's a very good question. So here's what I would say. Um, I'm. I've always been a little bit uncomfortable personally with how to connect the microscopics of how a Joseph's conjunction works to, uh, to how a qubit works. I can write down the equations, right, for the effective field theory, but, I, but I've always kind of wondered if there's a nice intuitive picture here. Um, Dave says that the picture of uh, super pair tunneling is intuitive. And maybe it is for a solid state person, it isn't for me. Um, so all this object is, and this may or may not be the answer that you wanted, but it's the one that I can give you. Uh, this object, we prepare a superfluid of some number of particles, okay? That is uh, the ground state of, uh, of this object, but with some small imbalance between the two wells, okay? And then we tune them to resonance with each other. And, and watch the oscillation. And the thing that's very interesting, mm -hmm, so this is the interesting thing. Here, what we're looking at is the, the oscillations between the left side and the right side, okay? 
And what you see is as you make the barrier taller, those oscillations get slower and slower. That makes sense, right? Because you have to virtually tunnel through the barrier. By contrast, this is looking at the left side of the left well compared to the right side of the left well. Those oscillations more or less don't change speed as you change the barrier height, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the real point is what you really like if you wanted this thing to be a single mode object, right? You don't want any oscillations within the left well or any oscillations within the right well. What you really wanted was a condensate in a single mode in one well, a condensate in a single mode in the other well, and tunneling back and forth between them. So the interesting question to me is, is there a regime of this system where these oscillations don't occur? The basic point is, it's, it's sort of a little bit unsurprising that they're there because the tunneling is really happening from this site to there to that site. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, is there a parameter regime where that happens, or is the basic thing that's required to do that? This is what I'm curious about. Do you have to have some non-local interactions between the particles on the two sides to kind of stabilize the condensate wave? Mike, did you raise your hand? Do you have an answer to that? That's too bad. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. Well, here's what I, there, there are several answers there. One, I would say this thing isn't quite a chemical potential, but remember, if this object has two photons in it, the second one decays fast, right? So what that means is this object, if, it's, if, if you end up with too many photons in your system, two photons in some site, the second one will be able to tunnel into this thing and will not be able to tunnel back, right? It'll be irreversibly lost immediately. And so you can think of this as an object that will give you photons of one energy and take away photons of higher energies. If it were really a chemical potential in some, if it were really a chemical potential in the sense that we talk about in thermodynamics, it would be able to give you particles at any energy up to that energy and take particles away at any higher energy, right? So it's not quite that, but it's like a mini version of that. And so to me, this is part of what's beautiful about doing these things in these microscopic systems. You start to get a flavor of how, uh, how all of this stuff actually works. Here's a question for you. Where does the entropy go? You're sucking the entropy out of the system. Where did it go? dissipated into the resistor, right? The only thing in this system that breaks reversibility is that resistor in the RLP circuit. It's a good question. We have not tried to measure uh, like a second sound kind of thing, but you're right. We probably should. I see. I see. You're just saying a phase. Yeah, I, I, I have to say we haven't tried to measure it. Um, I, I do feel like it's a I mean, do these strongly correlated superfluids have that? Okay. So, so I'll tell the students to measure it. <laughs> 
Pardon? We're always measuring density here. Yes. This is new data, so I, but it's a great question. Mm -hmm. so, so I think there are several answers there. Um, one of the answers is that um, many of those proposals that I drew were based upon the idea that what you should do is a James Cumming Hubbard, right? Because in, in, in cold atom experiments, all of the theory said, you know, we can couple cavities together, right? And the atoms can make the cavities nonlinear, right? And that's how you make your Hubbard-ish model, okay? The, so that was our initial line of thought, because that's where I come from. But they've pointed out, you can actually directly couple the qubits together, right? And that makes the model much simpler than adding all of these unnecessary ancillary resonance. So that's one piece of the story. The other thing which I think is quite interesting is when Alex Ma made that eight qubit sample, it was actually the largest sample in academia by I, I think a reasonable margin. Right. So and you know I think that the engineering that that went into reducing the disorder and controlling all of those qubits and reading them out was pretty non-trivial. Uh, of course, uh, Alex Ma, who did this and is now faculty at Purdue, came from the quantum gas microscope experiment from Marcus Reiner's lab. So eight qubits was not so complicated for him. But, but I think this is part of the blessing and the curse of these circuits, right? The data that comes out at the end is very beautiful and clean and nice. But as I'm sure people from Irfan's group can also tell you, uh, you know, controlling eight of these qubits and making them do what you want is uh, not as trivial as one as one would like yet. Fair? I thought you had a question. You can just come down and we can chat. Thank you all.